Welcome back to the Data Driven Real Estate Podcast, the podcast for real estate professionals dedicated to driving business using data. I'm Aaron Norris along with Sean O'Toole with Property Radar, and today we have Greg Clark. He's a trustee sale buyer out of the Bay Area who's done over 400 transactions over the last decade uh, at the courthouse steps. And of course, California Senate Bill 1079 uh, has really changed things as of January 1st of this year. Uh, the new redemption period we covered in an entire show an hour long a couple months ago. I'll make sure to put that in the show notes. But what happens when your cheese is moved and you are forced to look at new ways of doing business when things out of your control make that happen? Today, that's what we talk about. Trusty Sale Buyers has a, a completely different skill set than a lot of other investors. One of the hardest strategies for you to deploy in the real estate investing realm what do you do when you can't do that anymore? We talk about chocolate and peanut butter. Chocolate is what you bring to the table and trusty sale buyers, you have a lot of very unique skills that not all uh, real estate investors have. And when you realize what those skill sets are and what you're passionate about, what you're good at, how it transfers, we can back it up with data to find you other things to do right here in the golden state of California. You won't want to miss the show. Hey, Greg, welcome to the program. It's so nice to have you here. Uh, who is Greg Clark? Hey, well, thank you. What's up, fellas? It's uh, great to be here. Greg Clark is just a uh, uh, guy out there trying to make a living, you know. Um, <laughs> an ex-football player, dumb Stanford graduate, uh, trying to figure it out. And, uh, you know, it's I, I got in this business after I retired from football, kind of fell into financing. And pretty quickly after that, in 2004, I was like, I got to get into real estate investing. I'd experimented a little bit with it um, in 2001, 2002, trying to find some, some people that were willing to sell their home. Uh, you know, didn't have a ton of success. But anyways, long story short, uh, had a guy that bought a house next to me um, in foreclosure. And that was kind of my introduction to it. And I was like, wow, this is, this is when I was playing. And, uh, next thing I knew playing, when I retired, playing football. yeah, when and I was you, playing football. And who'd you play for? Um, uh, arena league team, the San Francisco 49ers, you know, <laughs> <laughs> just, just a little, yeah, just, just a minor. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. So I did that and I got, I had a career in, career in the ending injury. And when I had a back surgery, I jumped into doing finance and, and then it, I just kind of never looked back. And um, so you've never, been real estate investing pretty much full time since when? So I started the investing part of it in right January 2004 was my first was my first purchase. And it was I, I knocked on a door, right? It was just ah. knocked on a door, got the tenants, got the owner. And she was great. She sold me the property at a good price. She just didn't want to deal with it anymore. And I was off to the races. And then the next thing was, I, I started going down to the court steps in Oakland and just started like watching the guy, started tracking stuff. And I'm like, this is interesting. I don't know how risky, I was so naive, completely like oblivious to what I was doing. Um, the you know, I had a trustee sales, right? So, yeah, so, so, tr yeah, so yeah. trustee sales, non warranty sales, you don't have title insurance, you better know your stuff, you got, you, you better know you're buying it first. I, you, you can tell all kinds of stories uh, around trustee sales and, the risk involved in them, but I just kind of kept, I caught the bug and I, I hooked up with a guy down there. He kind of like showed me the way, you know, I had to pay some, some strong fees to, to learn. <laughs> I, I did some crazy flips in like Parchester village and um, some pretty rough areas that kind of earned my stripes, so to speak. Yeah. And, and I kept some as kept some properties as rentals and kind of went that route. And so that's kind of how I got into it. And then the downturn happened and, Holy, it was just, I can't even, I still have trauma from that downturn, yeah. seeing it and realizing I'm nine months away from complete bankruptcy, how to make some really, really hard decisions. It's one of my proudest moments of being able to make it through that, but it, it took years off my life. And so I'd already, I'd understood the business. So I was tracking every city, every County. So when I saw, I had a certain indicator and when I saw that flip in April of 2008, no one was buying and the drop so I, bid. Yeah. I, I, no one's buying and they started dropping the bids and I was like, I'm going. And I, yeah. put, I, I was down, I was literally down to probably $500,000. But if you counted every, that's liquid. If I counted all the debt, I was negative. So I was negative and I just like, I'm going to go for it. I'm either going to lose it all or I'm going to be successful. And you know, the rest is history, right? It was the greatest investing era that we'll ever see in our entire lifetime. Right. And, you know, it was super hard, super risky. You know, you're trying, you're dealing, anyways, I could, 
I could go what on. Kind of volume, on but... What kind of volume were you doing? And, or, you know, did you do how many deals? So from 2008 to, to present, you know, it really slowed down 2017, you know, that type of frame. But during that time, we did over 400 deals. Yeah. And, and that's just me and my brother. So it wasn't like we were out there raising a fund. We weren't, we were doing it, our bootstraps, doing it ourselves, building our own system and then leveraging it with, uh, I was fortunate to have some commercial lines already established. And so we were leveraging it with commercial lines. It wasn't like we were doing it with hard money or anything like that. So it was personal guarantees, short-term balloon notes, um, and just trying to go through this revolving line of credit as fast as we could. Because we didn't yeah. realize this is going to last. Is this going to be two years? Is this going to be eighteen months? Is, and we're going to be back doing mortgages, you know, lending again. What's the opportunity here? And because there was such a slow movement by the feds and by the government to try to cure the system, try to help the system, this thing just got like prolonged out and out and out. I'm like, I can't believe we're in 2014 still buying, you know, defaulted Fremont loans or New Century loans or. Yeah. you know, some of these stern bear stern loans. And so that was kind of the route we went and it was a great, it's, it's been, and, and what I have to say is Sean, and I, I, I've, I've sent you a message before, but your software, I got, I was one of the early adopters. Like I think it was late 2007, somewhere around there. Someone put me in touch really with Really early. Yeah. We we're super early. It's probably the last time we actually spoke. You're like on the phone trying to explain to me, Hey, so this is we're just kind of learning. We're beta version, you know, it'll get better. It was, here's your free service for the next 12 months or 18 months or whatever it was. Might even been two years. You gave it to me. I can't remember, but that was life-changing for me. That software literally changed my life. It allowed me to have some independence, some freedom. It learned me to build it, build a system that I felt was going to work well for me. And it was incredible. So it was able to rebound my, rebound my way back. You know, I'm in a super good position now. And, you know, I can't, I can't personally give you enough props or gratitude or thanks. And honestly, that you're still around doing this. I thought you were going to go. I thought, I thought you were going to go down when the trustee sells. So I said, Oh, I feel bad for Sean and all these, this investment he's done. So the way you've <laughs> transformed it and gone national, the way that you're mining data, it's just, it's a kudos to you, the way your brain works. It's just really brilliant. And, you know, congratulations on all your success. So thank you from a guy that you probably don't get enough props enough for it. Well, thank you for that. Cause that's exactly why I do it. Right. Like at the end of the day, you know, hearing that story is what gets me up in the morning. And, um, you know, we've been fortunate we've had, we've done that for thousands and thousands of people. And, um, uh, you know, not just at the trustee sales either, but with all kinds of different um, investing sides. And then, you know, the number of realtors that, uh, you know, were basically out of business in 2008, but then found us and were able to mine for short sales and, uh, you know, not only survive, but thrive and have a bigger business than they had before. Um, yeah, it's definitely what keeps me going. So thank you very much for that. Yeah, people don't understand what other people were doing to to get that data, right? The, How you hard it people, was. You had people that literally were sitting in rooms cutting newspaper notice of defaults and notice of, well, excuse me, notice of sales. Well, actually, notice of defaults and notice of sales and putting them into yeah. their DOS program and then generating lists. I mean, it was, so the what you did was so much more harder, I think, than what people can appreciate. And then doing it at the scale that you've done it, being able to monetize it the way you've done it. It's really, it, 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 to be honest with you, you should be a case study for like a Harvard Business School case study. It's, 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 you, it, seriously, you should. It's one of those just crazy, incredible stories of data mining. And now I hear stuff that guys are doing. I'm like, what? Virtual <laughs> assistant in the Philippines mining data for what is going, what is going on in this, this, uh, this world? <laughs> It always, we have a map, right? That shows where our users are logging in from. And oh it's really God. incredible the number of folks that uh, log in from the Philippines and India working on behalf of some investor here uh, and, uh, and doing stuff uh, on a very daily basis. So yeah, you're totally right about that. Yeah, it's wild to see. So it's, it's that's a whole new world to me that I haven't, you know, that I haven't even dived into yet. So we're here today because your world changed January 1st, like 
you've had this business, trusty sales, it's been down. The pandemic really put a slowdown with the moratoriums right. and the eviction moratoriums. That was already hard. And then California came in with this crazy law, SP Senate Bill 1079, and, and really kind of just threw the whole foreclosure thing up into the air. It's a really poorly written law, lots of uncertainty around it, lots of uncertainty for trustees, lots of uncertainty for title companies, and a lot more than uncertainty for guys like you who've been down there. You know, and let's, I just want to frame this up. Like, I don't think most people, people are like, oh, those investors, those guys that go down and buy foreclosures, you know, the, the moms for housing thing in, in Oakland and the rest. And like the house is just sitting vacant. What well, was sitting vacant because the freaking city of Oakland wouldn't approve, you know, it takes forever to get approvals to fix the thing up, right? That's the only reason it was sitting vacant. It's not like it's some evil corporation. The number of properties that investors like you have purchased right? With no title insurance yeah. for all cash, like no homeowner can buy this property, right? It's, it's a mess. It, has, it still has the owner or an occupant living in it. It has to be dealt with. I mean, the number of issues there and you clean all of that up and put it back on the market for first time home buyers, for folks that need financing, et cetera, right? It's this really valuable service. And for some reason, you know, 10 years, what, what more than that, you know, 13 years after this crisis is over, they decide, oh, we need to go change this whole thing and, and mess it all up and, uh, and really kind of put you out of business January 1st. Yeah. So it's really, you've hit it the nail on the head. And, and I appreciate the way you frame that because people don't realize the service that a lot of people like me would do for the process. And people don't understand like how clouded title would get. And so, People will do all kinds of things to play the games, to circumvent the system, to delay the sell, to delay the eviction, um, BK filings going from the, the state, you know, and then filing in the federal system for the BK. And that takes su superiority to the state system. So the state defers and you're they play this game going back and forth. Right. So there's this, there's a lot, a lot of risk involved and you have to really know what you're doing, have a good attorney that can help you navigate through that. Uh, that. But it, but the, more importantly, the trustee sell process is a process to clean up a bunch of muck. You know, if you talk to really good title officers or title people in the plans, so they'll say, we love the foreclosure process because it gives us a blank slate. It's a clean slate to, to, to expunge everything and to start over. People throw all kinds of liens on it, trying to, you know, get as much money as they can in the system, you know, trying to attach to the property. And it just cleans the whole thing. So you're right. That's the hard part is this new law has complicated a system that was set up to help alleviate a problem that occurs in the background of all the different ways you can try to beat the system and navigate it. And, and, and so it's hard to be in a not, not investors trying to beat the system. Homeowners. Oh yes. Are, yes. Are just, you know, the homeowners that end up in this situation, yeah. a lot of times they've done all kinds of crazy stuff to try to extract as much value. Yes. And you know, uh, I, I am a firm believer in home ownership, and I, I don't, even low down payment things I, I believe should be available. But but on the other side, we need to be realistic that if somebody put very little down or nothing down and they stop making their payments, they don't really truly have some right to say that this is my home and that I should get to stay here even if I don't make the payments, right? The contract when they went in was, right, I, I am... I'm going to get the opportunity to be a homeowner in exchange for making these payments. If I don't make these payments, I'm losing my opportunity as a homeowner, right? And not only that, but we have the best system in the world, right? Period. Like it's the most consumer friendly, not best, most consumer friendly system in the world that says, okay, if I get in there and I don't make my payments, I still get to live there for free for quite a while, right? As I go through this whole process, I still get a ton of notices. I still get opportunities for mediation. I still get a million things before I even lose the house, right? So all of that existed. And SB 1079 now comes in and says, that's not enough. After the house is sold at the auction, we're gonna do this whole other process after the auction that, oh, by the way, we didn't document or make clear at all. 
right? Okay. So I should let you talk, but obviously I'm clearly fired up about this SP 1079 and not in a good way. Yeah, you've hit it. You've hit the nail on the head so well in your description of it. You, you had a clean process and people don't really appreciate what we go in there and do because most of these properties are not like clean properties. Most of these properties are problematic properties. They haven't been maintained. They have code violations. They have maintenance. You know, you're, there, there's already fines from the city because they're not maintaining the yard. They're, they're lived in hard. Sometimes you have like 20 cats and these, you know, you, you've, you see it all. And, you, and so we're going in there and cleaning up the whole situation, beautifying the property. If you look at a flip from most flips from the beginning to the end, it's a pretty big transformation that takes place. And it's a beautiful transformation that helps the community. It elevates home values. It helps the neighborhood. It brings in a good home buyer generally. And even if you make that property a rental, which is I know what they're worried about is all these rentals by corporations, is people deserve to rent a single family house. People who rent just shouldn't have to rent apartment complexes and you know two bedroom condos a family who makes money but doesn't have good credit should have the right to be able to, to rent a home that has four bedrooms, that has a yard, that their kids can be part of it, integrated into a community, and that gets alleviated um, without this process. And so now you, you throw up in the air. And so our, our 5013, you know, the people who become the, the ability, the, the bona fide secondary bidders in this process, you know, primary occupants and 5013Cs, are they really – do they really understand the magnitude of what they're going to take on by buying an uninsured trust deed that doesn't have insurance? They're paying all cash. Then they got to go evict and deal with the tenant. Do, they, do the legis My big thing is I get what they're trying to do, but the legislatures should have brought some people in and said ground on the, on the ground floor and really understood better kind of the problems we're creating because I just don't see 5013Cs coming in and doing all this rehab and then running out to a, you know, especially if you're paying, a, oh, we're at all time highs, right? Values. Values to rents right now are way wacky in the Bay Area. I'd probably... I, I, I put it this way, and I think it's important we start using this. And I think I'd like to see every investor start to say this, like rents in California are the lowest in the nation. That's mind boggling. Per, as per, a function, value, as, as of, a a function of the value of the property, yeah. right? It's it's yeah. some of the lowest returns in the nation. So if you own a property that you put up for rent, you're getting some of the worst returns in the nation, right? So I would say rents are the lowest in California that they are anywhere in the nation as a function of home price. Yeah, you've hit it. Real, and that's exactly what happened to me in 2007. I had these rentals. Um, I had had them over leveraged because in, in my world, everybody was saying, hey, real estate's never gone down back to back years. <laughs> It'll never even in the savings and loan scan, you know, this, this and this. And, you know, you always had and I'm talking like smart economists, like people I was going to and listening to that were economists for big companies that were saying that real estate companies. And so what did I do? I'm like, okay, I'll go and just leverage this up and do this and do that. And then when the downturn happened, it really, um, what, what's, what's, what's the word I want to use for it? It's basically, um, stung by high leverage. You know, I was yeah. like stung mentally and I will never, I will never do that again. Right. I will never go there again. And it's probably hurt me. I'll do some short-term debt to get through a property, but in terms of Matt going out and leveraging and doing all, cause I can see how fast something can turn. And then you're in a difficult situation. Like right now, if the federal government wasn't just writing checks like crazy for people, unemployment, it would be a complete nightmare because in April, May, there was a lot of landlords that were freaking out over what was happening. Local landlords, right. Yeah. And rents weren't coming in. And then all of a sudden those checks came in and, things got better and people are still able to keep in the high eighties to 90% range on their collections, depending on their area and their demographics. But yeah, it's, it's so um, hard. So, I'm just going to come back. So SB 1079, we did a whole separate podcast on that oh, and man. people should yeah, go, was, that want to learn more about that should go listen to that bottom line, your world changed right, January right. 1st, not doesn't look very good 
for you, for your business of going down to the trustee sales, cleaning up these properties, putting them back on the market, that business may be over at least until, I mean, this SB 1079 has what it's two years or three years, but for the next two or three years, we'll see how it goes. We're watching it closely. Isn't uh, it five? Is it five? Is it only two or three? It might be five. Yeah. I thought it was, I thought it was five when it, I think from, cause I listened to that podcast before, which was super, super informative. Yeah. So my life, my life has changed. I kind of went up into the mountains when, when uh, COVID hit and I have a house up by Yosemite, hiked half dome, grew, I've never had a beard like this, grew a five, <laughs> a five inch beard, ah, became, nice. became like a, a meditation mountain man, and then came back to civilization and was just like shocked to see this new bill and to read through it. And then, and then, and then to really understand it and try to understand it. And now seeing how it's playing out, everyone I've talked to who's been doing this business um, for a long period of time is taking a wait and see approach. Um, you know, right now we still have so many moratoriums, I think on all the federal related loans that you're not seeing a lot of stuff coming to sell at the steps, but there's definitely things that need, go ahead. Now I said, but you have cash. Yeah. You're, you're a ready and willing buyer, yep. right? And uh, you want to keep investing. You want to keep cleaning up houses. Yep. You want to yep. keep making them available to folks. You want to keep going. And so the big question, and I think the primary reason we're having this conversation today is to do some brainstorming about what does Greg do tomorrow? Like, what, 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 where do you, how do you shift now that this has happened, right? And how do we help you if we can, right, in that shift and, and make it happen and, and get you back in business when the trustee sales are perhaps shut down or, or a little higher risk than you want to go with? Is that... Right. That's what we want to do. Right. That's a fair assessment. And so to give you the answer right this very second is I'm just going to I'm not afraid to say I don't know. And right. so what I'm doing right now and what I've done for probably the last four to five days is I have absorbed myself in reading and learning and understanding different different segments of the business Um the opportunities that might arise from going out and networking with wholesale guys, guys that I, I can go build a relationship with that I think are trustworthy, they're ethical, they're just good people, um, and go out there. My big thing is if you work hard, um, you're relentless, you're a good person, you're kind to people, eventually things are going to work out in your favor, right? It might take a little bit longer, but things are going to work out and, they're gonna, and you're going and you're gonna to do well. So for me I right now... That. We've got hundreds of customers that have been going to the trustee sales that are in exactly the same boat as you. It used to be thousands, right? right. But the trustee sales have slowed down and it's whittled down to hundreds, right? So, but there's hundreds of guys trying to figure out exactly the, the same thing as you right now. And um, so I want to walk through that and I want to talk through like some ideas and the rest and what we can do there. Um, we talk a lot about chocolate and peanut butter, right? Like, so we've got data, which we call the peanut butter, right? But, you know, everybody wants that like secret list, like, oh, if I just mailed to this list, I'm going to make $100,000 a house, right? And that doesn't exist, right? It, it's you, you are going to have to bring something to the table. And right. one of the things I love about trusty sale investors is you bring some unique stuff to the table right off the bat, right? That almost nobody else does. And, and so I want to start by just kind of walking through those things, right? So one is you buy every house without title insurance. Yeah. Right? Huge, huge risk. You got to be able to know what you're doing with title. You got to either have someone that you really trust in a title plant, um, those relationships, and you got to do some educated decision-making, right? And, and the best that you can. And how long does it take you from the time you have an address to the time you make a determination on whether you're willing to buy that house on a title side? You know, I've been fortunate that I've, I've been pretty good at developing relationships. And so I've been able to get pretty high up in, in, in title um, plans and with different people um, and, and also having volume helps. And yeah. so I'm able to get in there. And so I can typically get a pretty good answer fairly quick. But sometimes I'll send my list out and try to narrow it down because they don't want to spend a ton of time doing that kind of stuff. And then 
if I'm still unsure, I'll do a secondary check with someone higher up on a particular property just to, to make sure someone that I really, really trust and I really value. And then I kind of get the green light. Same day, right? But they can, yeah, they can still make mistakes, right? They've not been, you still have issues even with that, that stuff that pops up and they're like, oh, I didn't, yeah, that was a harder to find document. But my point is, is you can look at a property, yeah, you know, in the morning and that afternoon, make a decision whether you're willing to take the risk on title to buy it or not. Actually quicker than that. Sometimes I'm looking at a property, the sale's coming up, we're just barely getting there. We're doing that evaluation, why it's being read off. You're trying to make that assessment. You might still have title on the other, on a separate phone where they're just checking something, something out and you're, it can come that close to the, to the time frame, And so you're making decisions back in the day, you're making decisions within seconds. It seemed like, like, go, 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 go. And then that would be the difference of you making an extra 50 to hundred grand versus not. So the bill, so the benefit is today, if there's someone out there that wants to offload a property or there's a wholesaler that says, Hey, I want to, I want a guy that just can make a quick decision. I don't want to deal with this, this, and this, and all these inspections and all these nuances that are going to come from someone that wants to be more careful. They can come to a guy like me, who's been doing this for 17 years, make super fast, quick decisions, can look at a property and say, yeah, I'll take it for this amount of dollars, or you want to give me it for this. And the decision can be made pretty quickly, right? It's not like they're having to him and haw or, or worry about it. And, and I'm used to that there, risk. There are some differences though. So we need to be like, so if you're going to go out directly to a homeowner and say, Hey, listen, I can make this decision right now today. Right? Like, cause where I'm getting at here is trusty sale investors have this ability to do this quick due diligence. Right. Right. And they're willing to take on some risk and right, right. Uh, they do it at pretty low margins, really. Right. When you look at what they do, and pretty much everybody else that's coming in with an offer is going to need a 30-day escrow, is going to need inspections, right? Even these iBuyers and, and these folks that are coming in, they, they all are still planning to come in and do all their inspections and nickel and dime that owner later and, and all the rest, right? So, yeah. I mean, this is a huge advantage for the trusty sale investors. And I realize they like just going down to the auction and the rest, but they have a huge built-in advantage. There is one key difference, though. Is like, okay, you decide you're going to do a deal. You're going to buy that place from that owner. You're going to do it today, right? It's a little different than getting a trustee's deed because a trustee's deed cleans up a bunch of stuff. Yep. Where now you're going to do like a grant deed and it's not going to clean up that stuff. Yes. So it is, there is a little risk there, a new risk there, a different risk there, you know, for a trustee sale buyer to go buy directly from homeowners. But there's also this huge advantage they have over pretty much every other investor out there in that they can make decisions quickly. You can make decisions quickly. Right. Yeah. So you, you've hit, you, you've nailed it pretty good. I think that's true. There's some quick decisions. Obviously if someone's selling their property in a different fat in, in that type of forum, you don't have a trustee sell that cleans it up. You know, you want to open up a title and have a quick title search done. So it's done kind of in an efficient way, um, a professional way. Uh, I, I got to tell you though, I did multiple deals as a trustee sale investor. I started doing direct mail and uh, I did multiple deals where I did a grant deed and a cashier's check the same day the person called me. Really? That's fascinating. And nobody else can do that other than a trustee sale investor, right? And yes, the title has to look okay and you got to do all that stuff, but like, and I'm not suggesting to all of our trustee sale investors that they go do that. But if you think about the differentiator that is, right? And how much of that process you already have as being a trustee sale investor, it's not a stretch to get to that position. That's a great avenue. It's a great way to look at it. Just making sure the person you're giving the check to is actually the person on title. Well, that- <laughs> Which, there's, which is there's multiple yeah. important things to do there, yes. right? For sure. Yeah. For sure. Right. Yeah. I, I could see someone being like, Hey, yeah. I, and, and then you realize that there's another person on title. Right. Uh, and, and then all of a sudden you have, you, you could be in, a, in a, a, a pickle or a predicament, but yeah. You know, if you're someone that's super diligent, understands that you've vetted the person, there are some definite advantages that you could do that. 
if in fact you do, and you do have relationships with title companies so you might be able to do set up a quick close program with your title company where they do at least check you know certain things and give you some sort of uh, insurance policy maybe with some more exceptions than their normal policy but that's something else i think is worth looking at for you as a as a past trustee sale investor now looking for other alternatives yeah, it's a great option. It's a it's an option that's it's certainly there, certainly available. Um, yeah, so it's it's trying to explore that whole avenue and trying to absorb all that information, and then try to narrow it down. My, my big thing is like take in as much as you can, try to understand it, and then figure out what you're good at. Because I'm going to keep throwing ideas at you here, so that's what we're going to spend the next uh, thirty keep minutes going. doing. I have all a, right. So, Greg, I have oh. a question for you. I think it says yeah. a lot about you that you stuck around in the trustee sale investor space because it has been more difficult. And what people might not know is, this is a question: How many houses did you have to see to buy one at the trustee sale? Oh, jeez. Whew. That's. Uh, I would say, you know, sometimes people say fifty. I'd even say maybe more than that, maybe even like 75 to hundred. I don't mean just like C I'm talking about, do all the research on, do all the title, um, do everything that you have to do and the inspections. Um, it is laborious. It is a lot of work. It is time consuming. And that's why people can't stick with it because they're like, Oh, this isn't worth it. And I'm like, you know what? You have to go out every single day. You can't miss a cell. You can't miss an opportunity. And if you do that consistently all the time, that's why I tell people you can't be um, a, a part-time worker here. You can't be a part-time realtor and a part-time real estate investor. I mean, I've been a real estate broker since 2002 and you can't do both. You can do it maybe when there's a ton of stuff, but when, when it's a situation where you're, you have to be out there every single day, every day. And it is like people who don't do trusty sales, they think that, Oh, you just go down to the core steps and sit around and wait for a property. And you, you're buying it sight unseen. It's, it's super easy. You guys don't understand what it's like to do the work. I'm like, are you kidding me? This is like so hard to do and to do it relentlessly and consistently every day. So yeah, you're right. Probably a hundred, I'd say probably a hundred, 75 to hundred properties to one. I wanted and, to bring that up. Taken a photo of each of those. You've oh, done yeah. comparables on each of those to figure out value. You've done a title research on each of those, right? Or, or, or you kind of get out to a property and you see, and you're like, ah, oh, it's off the list, you know? So you kind of like weed them out pretty quick or you can do a, uh, a Google drive. I've made the mistake right before I do a Google drive by and I'm like, oh geez, that's a disaster. And this just happened. This is one that just happened a few months ago. I was like, oh, that's a disaster. I wouldn't go on that. Well, unbeknownst to me, I just did the Google search. I didn't even take the time to look it up on the MLS it's this beautiful remodeled property. And I'm like, are you kidding me? What was I thinking? Someone, you know, it was still was kind of a little bit of a thin risky deal, but I was just kicking myself. I'm like, how did you not like take the time to just look on the ammo? So sometimes you get, you see something, you don't do the complete work because you see so many of them that you get right. a little, you get a little lazy. Does that make sense? You just kind of like mark it off. Cause you, you only have so much time to look at, look at stuff. Yeah. But yeah, you do a lot of work. So I, I agree with you. A lot of work it goes into it, but you try to weed them out as fast as you can because you only have so much time. When it's so turn, just turn that around, right? And which is you already have the systems in place to go out and take photos and do due diligence and to go to a next level on a list, right? That your average investor doesn't do. Most so let's just step back. Most investors like that do direct mail or cold calling or whatever, they're calling on a list but they haven't taken the time to look, do a photo. They haven't taken the time to drive by the property. They haven't done any title research, right? They're waiting to hear first from the owner that they're a willing seller. And, right. um, you know, and then they'll go do that research. So they're doing a research only when they have somebody on the hook. It's a, right. it, it's completely different business in a lot of ways. And you could go all the way over here. But what I want to talk about is with you as a trustee sale investor, how do you leverage these things that you are uniquely good at that differentiates you from every other investor? So one is you can do title insurance really quickly too. You can do the inspections really quickly and, and you're willing to buy a house just looking at the outside, not even going on the inside, not getting a pest report. Not getting right. All of that, right, is, is what you've had to do all these years. All 400 deals. 
it nips you in the butt sometimes that's for sure it uh but yeah you you have to bake it into the deal right so you have to kind of bake in a certain element of risk you got to say hey you can usually generally look at a property and tell from the exterior um, components of it, the yard, uh, the way the outside uh, maintenance is. And you can say, okay, if the outside looks like this inside probably is going to look like this and just make that natural assumption where you get yourself in trouble is when you, you realize like I have all this HVAC asbestos situation. It's not, it's not functioning. So I got to bring in a, a qualified person to remove it. I've got, um, electrical that's all outdated. So if I go update the kitchen, now I got to redo all the electrical and then all, all the, all the plumbing needs to go from one type of plumbing. to. to so there's all these things that go through your head. So you kind of have to bake that in and say, Hey, here's my right. best case scenario, but I can do that pretty fast. So there is some advantages to that, to be able to make that determination, that decision, say, Hey, here's the value of this property fixed up, back all the costs out. Assume if it's a certain age home, you're going to have these additional costs and come up to a number pretty quick. Cause you've just done it so many times you can just ballpark it. And sometimes it works out. You're, you're a little bit below that. Sometimes you go, you kind of skyrocket above it, but that's part of the risk of the business. And so you kind of bake it in. And if you go too thin of margins in this business, I've just learned if you're impatient and you're so ready to just throw your money, which a lot of guys right now are doing, a lot of guys are very impatient and they say so they want to rush into a deal and they want to buy it because they want to be that guy's, that wholesaler's number one guy. And so they might take on a level of risk or even leverage it in a way that I see a lot of guys leveraging, leveraging properties now on flips that they're leveraging their, their entire purchase price. And then they're having a secondary person come in and leverage with an IRA, the entire remodel cost. And I'm like, wow, that is, yeah. that is, that is a, uh, for the investor side of it, that's pretty, pretty, uh, I don't know so, the word I, what I want to say, but it, it's, it's, you got some, you got some cojones to, to uh, be making yeah. that decision. So, yeah, go ahead. I, 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 I'm, I'm, I'm just in that formulation. I'm going to keep, right I'm, keep give, I'm going to keep, I, hey, I, I want to first talk about chocolate and then we're going to talk about some ideas of things you can do that Perfect. I think might be, you know, might yeah. actually, you might actually find you have a better year this year than you did last year in trustee sales. That's my goal for you. I want you to have your, I want you to have one. It, it's going to be hard to repeat 2009, 2010. It'll never, like it'll those, never happen those, again. Those will probably never happen again, but I want you to have, I want your 2021 to be better than 2019 or 2020. And I want to help you get there. Okay. Great. And every other trusty sale investor that's listening, right? Fantastic. That That's, that's our goal here. Um, so like there's some of these things that are just baked in, right? I think each of our trusty sale investor customers like you probably also bring something else kind of personal, right? Like, I knew a guy who was really good at, at, you know, doing cash for keys and getting the folks to move out without having to go through eviction. That's an important skill right now, right? Um, another guy really good at like, uh, you know, older homes and he'd buy the older ones that nobody else wanted because he was a contractor and he could do, he knew how to do foundation repair and those kinds of things that are, can come up and really cost you on older homes that keep people away, Right. Um, some folks are really good relationship guys back on the non-trusty sale folks. Like most of our trusty sale folks are over there because they don't want to deal with people. <laughs> but on the other side, right, the wholesalers and stuff, like they're really good at, at yeah. talking people up and the rest, right? Yeah. Um, so um, any anything like that uh, for you, I just want to know before we get into ideation, anything like that for, that's for you that you think like, a personal strength, you and your partner or whatever that differentiates you from other investors, or at least is, is something unique. Anything along those lines you could think of other than all the trustee sales stuff's awesome. We're going to count that all in. Right. Yeah, no, I, so I have a brother who is a partner with me. He's been out here since 2000, I think seven, some 2000, maybe 2005, 2006. And he's, he's really, really good. At, I think we're both really good at working with people. So the cash for keys, um, situation, pr problem solving, you know, really you become, if you want to be a real estate investor, you got to be a real estate problem solver or a people problem solver. You got to be able to help people see things when their judgment is clouded by the, the, the turmoil of just life circumstances. And when you can let people see things clearly and build a relationship and rapport with them, it's amazing the things that you can do the things that you can figure out with, uh, with a homeowner or with a tenant or working out an arrangement. So I think the people skills 
is an asset of ours. I think it's an, it's an area that I can really improve on too, right? I'm not coming in here saying I, I'm really good at this because I haven't been doing it for the last 15 years. But so there's a humility factor there where I realize the biggest thing that I'm realizing in this process, Sean and, and Aaron, is for me, I have to be willing to be humble, to realize there's a lot of stuff I don't know. And there's a lot of people out there that know a lot more than I do in areas that I don't know stuff. And so if I'm just going to be an arrogant, wealthy guy that can go out there and I, I've done it this way and I'm going to keep doing it this way, I don't think you're going to have a lot of success. I think you have to be super humble and be willing that you have to almost go back. I, I feel like I'm in 2004 again, where I'm out at the court steps the first time trying to figure it out and, and navigate and learn my way. And so I think if you have a dose of humility and a willingness to like embrace new concepts, new ways new relationships, new ideas, and you're going to have to work on different techniques and a different style than you have in the past. And you, I, I also think I totally agree with everything you just said, but combine that humility on the, what you don't know right. with a whole bunch of friggin' swagger that you're a trustee sale investor because trustee sale investors are the baddest ass investors out there period well, right? they take on more yeah. risk they do more like I, I just i have more respect for trustee sale investors like just the, the amount of risk the number of issues you take on and the rest like so so i think a have that humility that you've got to go do something new right and and there's things to learn but also bring, don't just go do, because guess what? There aren't very many trustee sale investors that have made this switch yet. Right. right? right. So there isn't really anybody for you to go model and learn from or not very many. Right. right. And so th this is a really, and if you just go model and learn from the guys that are wholesaling and doing these other things, you're not going to bring all this stuff you learned right? From trustee sale investing to this side, and you're going to leave that behind. And I think you can take one plus one and make it five. Yeah, no, you bring up a great point. And that's kind of the process. That, look, I'm not too prideful enough to admit that I'm in a formulation process right now. So I'm formulating how to merge the two together. And so I have all these, I have all these like ingredients, but I haven't figured out the measuring cups, so to speak, of how I'm going to put that whole formula together to bake a really good cake. So right now I might be missing sugar. I might be missing flour. I might be missing the eggs or, you know, all the, or bake, whatever it is. And mm -hmm. I'm in that process of, go ahead. Let me keep throwing, I want to keep throwing hey, stuff at on. you and getting your feedback on right, like, go. oh, that sounds good. Or that doesn't sound good for me. Like, okay. So some ideas that I have, right. So now that we, you've got this relationship, people skills, right. You've got your trusty sales skills. That's, that's right. your chocolate. Right? right. I've got data. I've got peanut butter. Like, let's mix these things up and make something good and give you a great year. So big picture possibilities. If you're a trustee sale investor in California, this has happened to you. What do you do? Big possibility, right? Number one, keep doing what you're doing, but do it in other states, right? Yeah, there's that Arizona, option. Nevada, Oregon, Utah, Texas, right? Uh, you go into the judicial states and that starts to be something a little different, but about half the country is, is trustee sales schedule. It's exactly what you've been doing, right? I would say a couple of challenges there. One, and, and I would love your thought, have you thought about other states and what's keeping you from doing that? Or, or are you attracted to that? Where, where do you stand on that? Sure. So certainly I did a whole evaluation on, well, let me tell you the first thing I did. The first thing I did that I had not done is I went and started watching all the tutorials on property radar. I think, that's, I think that's the first step, right? I just was like, I don't need to listen to this. I, I got my system down. I know what I'm doing. I got, I know how I'm using the data. And so that's the first step I did was I went, you guys have some really, really good stuff. And so for all the trustee sell owners, I'd say, look, the first thing you need to do is don't be too prideful to educate yourself on what radar can offer set up tutorials. I got a tutorial right after this with you guys to try to go through and to look at different ways and different avenues to take what you're talking about, the, 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 the peanut butter, yeah. the chocolate, whatever you guys have, and be able to figure out how I can incorporate that into what I want to do as I try to formulate my path going forward. So that's the first thing I would say. The second thing when it comes to like going to other states, sure, we've looked at that. And then you look at the complexity, like, okay, 
to go move there to set up to set up shop to understand um, a rural area to develop the relationships it's it's a pretty big monumental task when you kind of have, you have, like where you live you don't want to yeah. move your kids family wife friends yeah. yes yeah, so you have all that and so you really want to uproot your your whole like there comes a point in life where you cherish just the point just being alive and having friends and there's a lot more than than making money um, it's about spending time with family. It's about spending time in the mountains, hiking, biking, doing all those different things. And so you got to evaluate that whole thing. And so do you want, so what I did is I did deep dive analysis on all the other States. I went to every single state. I went in and looked at all their trustee sales for the past 12 years. I broke down the data. I looked at the points of purchase. I kind of did a quick AVM on kind of where like, to see what the spreads and the margins were. It taught me a lot about what those states were, if I were to ever move, where I would want to go, where I would not want to go. There's definitely areas I'm like, geez, I am not going there because those are the, the, the compression ratio is like the worst I've ever seen. And then you go somewhere else and you'll be like, hey, there's some opportunities here. And but then it comes down to that you want to go set up a, a, a JV venture with someone else and try to go that route. And, and, and again, the foreclosure process is super risky. So do you trust someone else in another state to do that for yeah. you, kind of like a bigger project, like some of the bigger companies that do this do. Well, you're handing people checks for a half million, a million bucks a day to go down to the sales for you. It's, it's scary. So, okay. Yeah. So, so other States that's out for you. Not now, doing that. I, I want to say it's, it, I want to say it's out. I just know how complicated it is doing it locally. And I'm just a big, big believer. If you can't figure out how to do it in your backyard, if you can't figure out how to do it where you live and where you're at, your, your problems aren't going to be easier just going somewhere else. Uh, I think another great one, right? Just I'm going to keep us moving for keep time. It going. Keep it going. Another great one, um, and you've talked about this, and I think you're interested in this, is building a wholesaler network, right? And having guys bring you deals because you can evaluate those deals quickly. You're good at that. You've got the cash to buy those deals, and so if you've got a network of guys bringing you deals and there's plenty of guys out there that want to get started in real estate, but don't have the cash, don't have the sophistication you have, you can teach them a lot, right? So you have a lot to offer them. Um, yeah, that, that's, that's probably the avenue that we're kind of honing in the, in the short term anyways, trying to figure out. And I've done a lot of research recently i kind of know who the players are i've kind of done some reverse engineering i kind of see what they're doing um how they're doing it uh there's some really good people out there on a small scale there's some ones on, there's a lot of small scale people there's a few bigger but it's also going out and having to develop a relationship with those people and being able to have rapport and being able to so you got to be able to have that that element but yeah if you can go in and add some if you can bring some moxie in terms of experience and say, Hey, look, I get this business. I understand. It. I get what you're doing. I appreciate what you're, you know, how you're doing this. It's pretty remarkable. I want to be a part of this. And here's what I have to offer. I can bring in this set of skills and we can either JV on a deal or we can actually just pay a fee and, and move on. And, and you guys, if you want to go that route, if you want to have a bigger piece of the pie and want to JV on it, great. If you want to learn the process, kind of how see it from the very beginning to the end and learn that part of the business. Cause that's a hard part of the business, right? People don't, un, don't really appreciate how much it is to find good vendors that can do the work for you at a price that makes sense. Cause if you just go buy a contractor and say, I need you to do this whole job for me, you're not going to make very much money. No. So you might have a contractor that you have a relationship with that can be the umbrella but then you got to plug in all these subs that you've used over the years who you like and you trust, and they're going to be there on time. They're not going to be sniffing paint and gone one day and there the next day. And, you know, you, you have all these, experience, yeah. you have all these, you know, you know what I'm talking about. We've all had these experiences. So you bring a certain skill set to the table that someone else who's younger might want to learn or someone else who's wholesaling says, you know, I like this guy. Um, I want to be able to just to do business with someone where I have a deal. He gets it. He sees the numbers and I want him on my buyer's list. And I probably want to go to him first because I, you know, I can make, I know I'm going to make a certain margin. I can be in and out and I can move on to the next deal. Cause there's guys that just want to do that. Right. So there's a couple, there's a couple different avenues that we're looking at and we're kind of exploring yeah. that right now. So I think wholesalers, right. You got to build that network, right. Yes. It's definitely a relationship building thing. Yeah. Have you, have you tried yet going to the um, real estate investor clubs? They, most of them have the haves and wants and you stand up and say, Hey, 
I've done 400 deals. I've got cash and I'll buy all the wholesale deals you can bring me. Like it's, I, you know, it's one place to go. Have you done that yet? That's one where we've, we've actually been aggregating that, that information. In fact, I was just talking to Aaron yesterday. I was like, Hey, give me some, cause Aaron speaks at a lot of these different groups. Totally. He, kind of, he kind of knows them. And so we're kind of, you know, it's funny. It's like, I'm in that point right now where I could, I have so many ideas in my head and I'm like an idea guy. And I got to like, I'm in the process of trying to like I narrow, choose. I got to narrow down to a focus, laser focus on a couple things, focus on that. And then massage the other areas as I'm going. So the number one thing is to get absorbed into, I mean, we're in COVID-19, so it's kind of hard to just go like, Hey, go hang out at a investor club or most, most of them have moved online to zoom calls. So yeah, you can totally. totally do it. So that's the thing is we're starting to reach out to some of those starting to understand who those people are, the people who are participants in them, trying to find groups on Facebook, you know, social media, um, people that are trying to push and promote and advertise and network that way. So we're we'll, in the beginning. We'll make, sure, we'll make sure any wholesalers listening here uh, get your contact info and yeah. can reach out to you as well. Let, let, so let me do let me do a shameless, let me do a shameless plug. 925-989-7800. There you go. <laughs> right. Greg Greg at greenleafproperties.net. You know, hit me up, open for business, ready yeah. to ready to go, you know, hitting 2021 in a full stride. So yeah, hit me up anytime. I'd love to either try to work a deal or just even if you want mentorship, you want to, you know, any, a lot of different avenues that are, I love teaching. I love being a part of that. I love developing relationships. I like good people. You know, that's one of the reasons why Sean and Aaron, you guys are such, both of you are great people, great people, skills, just you're kind, you have a good hearts. And that's kind of what I like to mesh with is people like that. Awesome. All right, let's move on. We'll get the wholesaler thing network at the, at the real estate investor clubs, get out there on Facebook, get a following, you know, there maybe, maybe posting before and after photos. People love oh. that on all the deals you do. That's part of the deal. That's how you're going to do that. I know. I've, I've Especially been Especially so in that wholesale world. That's, I've been those, those so, guys, you know, it's funny being a, being a, a former professional athlete, you kind of like, you get done with it and you're like, oh, I just like to live under the radar and enjoy my life and you know because there's a lot when you're in that process there's a lot of people pulling on you from a lot of different ways for all kinds of things speaking events um oh yeah i could just go on for hours yeah. and so, so that's a really good that's a really good point though for all of our trusty sale investors because this yeah. this podcast is designed for trusty sale investors yes. going through exactly what you're going through yeah. so it's, it's a really good point like part of building that wholesale network is really yeah. putting yourself out there yes. to find those wholesalers right it's yeah. not it's not show up at the trusty sale or have an agent show up at the trusty sale and, and live completely under the radar, right? Yes, you yes. got to build and put yourself out there in a different way. So I think that's one of the downsides, you know, of really getting good at the wholesale guy, you know, side. The guys that I know who have built large wholesale networks and do a lot of deals that way, like they run clubs, they yes, yes. You know, do, do big uh, events even. And uh, it's all kind of, you know, yeah. They're constantly on bigger pockets podcasts and doing yeah. all that kind of stuff. And that's and they do boot camps and trainings to like because you keep funneling in new wholesalers to find that, you know, gem in the rough. And it, it is a whole, especially if you want to do 400 deals, you know, it it takes a pretty good process to make that happen. So that's the downside of wholesale. Let's talk about some other things that I think you already have, you've got folks, somebody is going around driving and taking pictures of the upcoming trustee sales. And back in the day in 2008, you were, you were doing that at scale. You were, you were going out and looking at probably 20, 30, 40, 50 properties a day. Is that right? Yeah. You'd have, you get, you get up at six thirty, six o'clock and go to bed at two 30, you know, you go get up two 30, get up early and you would start sending drivers out. Right. So you usually have, you know, at one point we'd have three, sometimes four drivers, you know, out driving, looking at the properties, um, giving their feedback, sending pictures in, um, giving you like what they think the, the S you know, basic repair, repair list might look like. Um, and hopefully you guys were using the property radar app and they're taking the photos and having yeah, them added right we, in the app and added in the notes. And we weren't in the early days, that's for sure. Um, and I can't even remember when I, we started realizing, Hey, this is like a pretty good function. It was years ago, but there was a point where we started doing that. And that was a, a great, 
um, add on to the, to the app. And so, yeah, it was super helpful. And so, yeah, we, we, we did that. So ramping up. So I think one of the things as a trustee sale investor, it's something you already do, you know how to do, right? Now there's a new piece to this is you put some drivers out there driving for dollars, right? And looking for boarding up houses and that kind of stuff. And probably also driving some lists that you build, right? Where you're going and having them target folks with potential distress situations, right? Getting that photo and getting those notes put you way ahead of the folk that's just blind mailing people. Right. Does that make sense? Yeah. So that's kind of one of the things we're looking at doing is being able to segment a list and, you know, and, and look, we're not the only ones doing this, right? There's a lot of people doing it. You know, we were talking earlier that this whole new world of having virtual assistants in the Philippines and refining these lists and doing all these different things and mining and different ways that you can look at the data. But again, it, 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 you got to get someone out there generally on the streets talking to somebody um, and so we're evaluating exactly how we want to do that. Um, do we want to try that ourselves to try to learn it, to go through that process? Do we want to develop that skill? And if so, you know, what are we willing to do? Are we willing to, you know, another, if another thing is you're, if you're willing to go that route, it's like, if you have the money, you know, you might as well take some, get some coaching and you might need to do some coaching to really understand. Cause there's people out there who have refined this in a really real tangible way. They have really good skill sets. They, they've learned how to um, build rapport. They've learned how to ask the right questions. They, they, the biggest thing I've learned in life is get someone else to talk and let them share, you know, their story, let them share their thoughts, let them speak. And you'll build, you'll be amazed how much rapport you can build with someone by letting someone talk and asking them the right questions. And so I think, I think there's, there's a level of where we're looking at that too. Like, do we want to develop that skill set? So it's kind of exciting. And, and to be honest with you, it's, it, it's exciting and scary at the, at, and scary at the same time. Right. And, you know, it's hard to, to be uh, vulnerable and to say that, but it's true. It, it is. Right. And, and I'm not too, um, you know, I'm not, I'm not too above saying that. And so it's, I'm excited to do it. And so, yeah, that's what we're doing. We're meeting with you guys. We're having some tutorials. We're going to go through stuff. We're going to have like, he's going to teach us some different things and we're going to look at it and figure out, Hey, is this an Avenue? a resource that can be valuable to us. Just one thing to keep in mind, right? Even with my support folks internally, right? Like we kind of helped, we kind of helped trustee sale investors, right? With doing trustee sales. And we've helped these guys out here that are going and knocking on doors, driving for dollars, doing list-based marketing. I think that there's some one plus one equals five opportunities that maybe even my own team doesn't understand yet right? In terms of, I really want you, even as you're talking to Keith and, and talking about doing list-based marketing, right? And direct mail and custom audiences and all these things that we've brought to this group over here that the trustee sale investors haven't used at all. Like, come learn all that. Like, I, I totally want you to learn all of that. But I want you to think about how you can differentiate it with what's unique about you coming from trustee sales, right? So, you know, rather than just making a list, right? Think about, okay, everybody else is doing direct mail where it's, I want to buy your house. Yeah, yeah. You could do direct mail with you or one of your guys, like you send your drivers out and they take a picture of them in front of the house, right? And yeah. that's what's on your postcard. And when that postcard comes in and it's their house, like they're going to go, what the heck, right? And they're going to look at it and read it longer than the guy who just wrote the run that we buy houses. Like, hey, I was in your neighborhood, saw your house. I'm super interested. Can you please give me a call so we could talk about it? Like that's a big differentiator, right? And you know how to deploy guys to go take 50 a hundred, whatever photos a day and quickly do that and systematize things, right? Because trustee sale investors, as you said so eloquently earlier, you have to systematize it because you're going to look at a hundred deals, right? We get these guys who want to start in direct mail. They send out a hundred postcards and they're like, I sent out a hundred postcards and I didn't buy a house with a hundred thousand dollar profit, right? <laughs> and you're like, I'd looked at a hundred houses to flip one trustee sale with tons of risk to make $25,000 profit, right? Like 
you just have so much more realistic a starting point right. uh, than most of these other folks and you understand scale. So I want you thinking about that as you're talking to our team and as you're working through this, bring that chocolate, right? That, that special sauce that you have as a trustee sale investor to this kind of new way uh, of, of doing things, right? And, and bring it over to this other side. And there's a lot of folks over here, you know, knocking on doors, driving for dollars, sending yep. postcards, not very many doing custom audience and, and some of the more advanced things that we can help you with. But um, I want you thinking about, okay, there's a lot of these folks out there. How do I differentiate myself in my message, right? You're a broker. You're, yep. you, you can do trustee sale and investing. You can clearly do the regular thing. So imagine giving somebody three options, right? I will buy your house today. We can close tomorrow. It's this price, all cash. We're done. Like, and you can just walk away. It's this price. Right. Or I can buy it from you wholesale, you know, and we're going to do the repairs and stuff. And this is what we think the after repair value is and on and, and all the rest. And then I could pay you, you know, this price, right. Or I'd be happy to help you with getting the property listed in the rest. And maybe you don't want to be a listing agent, which I totally get, but you can make 25 to 40% on a referral fee, referring that out to an agent that only helps you build relationships. And by the way, you can partner with that agent and say, hey, when you've got somebody who something happened and they need cash tomorrow, you can pay them on that deal. Yeah, they, those are they couldn't have done before. And so now you've got this whole thing you can go do with agents where you're referring business to them because you're doing all this marketing. And then they end up every once in a while running into deals that they can't do because it's a hoarder house or whatever. And so they bring that deal to you and say, hey, I can't list this, right? It's got problems, it's got issues, but they can sell it to you. Yeah, those are great ideas, great suggestions. Some of them we've discussed, bounced around, thought about, but I really think you're on the right wavelength of different ways of being able to assess this. And I think those are fantastic ideas. And that's one thing that's that's helpful is, is taking the time to brainstorm too. Because that, right, that's what we're doing right now. We're kind of brainstorming. We're in this whole new world. We don't know how this is going to play out in the state of California. And do you want to take on that added risk of you know what this legislation means. And so you can either do two things you can, and, and this is really, and I've talked to a lot of guys and, and a lot of guys are like, I'm going to take the sit back and wait approach. Um, you know, I've done well, I have money, I can diversify it into other things and, uh, you know, I can do whatever I want, you know, type thing, or I can go and start lending and do different things like that. So, or you can roll up your sleeves and, and while you're waiting, create a whole new skill set. And so that's kind of where I'm at. I'm like, you know what, I'm excited. I'm, I'm so excited to roll up my sleeves, put on the work gloves and create a, a create a skill set or maybe hone a skill set that I have that, that could be better. And so it's having these conversations, being willing to go out and to, like you said before, and uh, join these investment clubs, get on with property radar, figure out ways to do things a little bit differently. And hey, guess what? In six months of all of a sudden the trustee sales come back or a year and they kind of reformulate how they want to do this legislation. Fantastic. But in, instead of just, look, I just spent six months up in the mountains, basically fly fishing, <laughs> uh, hiking, growing this, this, my, my, my wife just can't stand this thing. She's so, she's like, I can't even believe you're going to go do this podcast with that thing. It's going to be like talking all over while you're talking. And, and, and so I've kind of done that, right. I've kind of had this reset mind. I, I, I never have taken a break like that for the last, like long, for a long time. Yeah. And you're ready you do, to get after it. Yeah. When you do this business, you kind of need to have a reset. It's always a good thing. I, I value family time. So spending time with my kids, one of the hardest things is my kid left for college this morning. Um, he's going back to play football and they're doing this. And he plays in the big sky. And so they do this, they're going to do this spring schedule. And I'm like giving him a hug. And I'm like, kind of like trying to hold back the tears. I'm like uh, they never gave you a manual, right. That said, <laughs> when you become a parent, it's going to like pull on your heart in these crazy ways that you never thought of. And so I value, I value mine that. off yesterday. Yeah. It's so hard. You know, I can see you're kind of like, you kind of start tearing up and welting up. Cause you're like, I never thought this was going to be as hard as it is. And you know, they're growing up and, and so you kind of start valuing 
your family time, your work time as you get older. But I've had that reset for the last six months where I'm like, okay, look, I took my time. I spent this COVID time. It was super valuable. I appreciate all the time I've spent with my family, having my other son home, both of them home for school, right? Because they came home and he came home in November. And I have a kid that's 12, 13, that's in seventh grade. And so you spend this time and it's good to rebalance and do that. And so I've done that. And now it's like, hey, let's get after it again. Let's get, let's roll up our sleeves. I don't want to sit around for another six to 12 months with the hope that this might come back. And my, and my offer to you and to every other trustee sale investor, successful trustee sale investor, right? Like there's only so many hours in a day and I can only do so much of this, but I, I would so I'd gladly your, sit down. Put your, cell, your cell phone on there for us? Yeah, for sure. <laughs> um, I would gladly sit down and, you know, give my cell phone number to any of these folks, you know, like I started out, is a trustee sale investor, right? I was in tech and then I did trustee sale investing and then built foreclosure radar. And, you know, those were, that was my core customer base. And then we did expand beyond that. And I've learned all these other things, which is awesome. And all these other ways to go about this business and, and, you know, uh, go after it. And I'd like to bring that all that I've learned back to that, this group that I, I think is, you know, uh, really got shafted uh, here with uh, SP 1079 and, and unfairly so. And so, you know, if you're a successful trustee sale investor and you're struggling with what to do next, um, you know, reach out to our support team, support at propertyradar.com or, you know, click the little uh, support icon in the thing and let them know that, you know, if, if you'd like to talk to me, I'm happy to sit down with you and talk to you about how, you know, an ID8 and whatever, um, you know, or as you have ideas, if you want to bounce them off me and, and, and I can say, hey, here's what's great about this and here's the cons of that, right? Um, happy to chat about that, you know, and happy to help everybody figure out what they can kind of personally bring to the table and, and make it happen. So to the degree I have hours in the day to do it, I will do that for every trustee sale investor trying to make this transition right now. And, uh, Greg, I appreciate you coming on today and and kind of letting us talk through this with somebody actually going through it because it's certainly something that we've got a lot of customers facing right now. Our support team is spending a lot of time um, with folks trying to make the transition. And and, uh, I just want to let people know that I'm here and happy to help as well. Well, thank you. And I appreciate, you know, the effort that you're making to um, obviously you're creating a lot more competition, <laughs> but with that, with every situation, there's always opportunity. And that's the way I look at it is, um, I appreciate what foreclosure radar property radar, what it's provided, um, for me personally, for my family, for my kids, and it's in a lot of ways for my mental health, you know, to be able to be in a position that you you might not have been in 10, 15 years ago. I think Aaron could speak to this as well. You know, having a father that's taught him the business and, you know, and how to do things and build systems. And now he's helping you elevate, you know, your company. It's, it's, it's great when you're trying to create an ecosystem where everybody's trying to help each other. And, you know, there's some competition in it, but that's the way life is. Right. And, and it, the people who are willing to work the hardest and, and do their best. And, and again, like I say, be kind to people, um, have good hearts. I think in the end you end up doing well, working out for you. And so from literally from the bottom of my heart, I'm so appreciative for everything that you and your, your skill set and your, your software has done for me. And for the time that Aaron has taken to talk with me and kind of point me in the direction and, and just realize that, and also for helping us understand, like we do have a, a really cool skill set that that you can leverage, and don't forget that, and don't you know let that go by the wayside. That's a that's a great point. It's it's uh, people don't appreciate how hard it is to do what we did with the level of risk that we did. And so thank you for you know everything that you've shared. We really really appreciate it. Awesome. All right. Thank you, sir. Thank you for listening to the Data Driven Real Estate Podcast. You can find show notes and links to some of the resources mentioned in the show at datadrivenrealestate.com. 
click that join the community and you'll be forwarded to the property radar community where you can ask questions about the current show and even see upcoming guests and ask questions there we'd love to engage with you in the community so check it out please don't forget to like favorite subscribe and share on your favorite platform where you're listening to the show it helps us out a great deal thanks for listening and we'll see you next week